in charge of introducing the speaker for this breakout session. This session is being recorded. The presenters will let you know whether you will be able to address your question at any time during the presentation or after the presentation has finished. The presentation will be delivered in English, so channel number one is available for you. Additional headphones are available in the exhibitor area. We will be appreciate that you will change your mobile to silent or vibrant mode in order to fully attend this session. Finally, we will distribute the evaluation form. Please make sure to complete it before to leave this session. Now we are ready to start. The presenter for this session is Dr. Carlos Gonzalez Rivera. Her biography information is included in the conference application and website. The title of this presentation is How to Create Massive Open Online Courses MOOCs to Reach Hispanic Worldwide. Please welcome Dr. Car Carla Rivera, no, Carla Gonzalez Robinson. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I know this is uh, the presentation right after lunch, so I'll strive to make it interesting. Um, if I see some nodding heads, I'll be asking questions of the audience. Um, feel free to interrupt me anytime. If you have a question, um, just call my attention and uh, I'll, I'll try to address it as best I can. Um, how many of you think that MOOCs represent um, uh, hope for higher education? How many of you think that MOOCs represent the fears of higher education? Okay. And how many do not know enough about it to uh, pick a side? Okay, okay. Um, I'll, I'll tell you my stance on it uh, before we begin. Um, I believe that tools, um, that MOOCs are a tool for higher education institutions um, that come in handy and that should be part of the arsenal of tools that um, universities have. Um, but they should be used in, in, as part of a large or overall strategy that advances the goals um, of, of the university or the strategic planning of the, the university. And it has its uh, pros and its cons, um, but I'll try to uh, tell you both sides of the story. Okay. In today's presentation, we'll learn how to create or how we created a massive open online course um, at the University of Puerto Rico, uh, our first MOOC. And uh, hopefully it will shed some insights uh, for any of you that are interested in exploring this uh, particular methodology to enhance or as a complement to your online learning offerings. We'll start with, um, because MOOCs is not an acronym uh, that's big enough, well, uh, I added another one. We'll, we'll start with the ABCs of MOOCs or uh, a primer uh, on what it is. We'll set the context of the first MOOC from the University of Puerto Rico. We'll talk about the production phases, um, which include design, production, assembly, and delivery of the MOOC. Um, I'll share with you some of the results that we had and lessons learned. Okay, MOOCs are massive open online courses. Massive has two components. It, um, it refers to unlimited participants. Um, one MOOC uh, is open enrollment, so um, usually a MOOC is, uh, can have hundreds of participants. It could have thousands of participants. Um, in 2008, Stephen Downs and George Siemens created the first MOOC and offered it in the University of Manitoba in Canada. That MOOC uh, reached 2,300 participants. Fast forward three years, and in 2011, Stanford offered uh, an artificial intelligence course that uh, was made available to a wider audience, and it, uh, the enrollment was 160,000 students. In that MOOC, uh, the youngest participant was 10 years old and the oldest participant was 70 years old. Um, most of the participants, or two thirds of the participants were from, not from the United States, and the top students uh, at the end of the course were not Stanford students. The top 400 were um, taking the course via the internet. 
So um, MOOCs are massive, lots of participants from any corner of the world. They're open because um, they don't present any entry barriers. That means uh, usually the enrollment is free for MOOCs, although there are some MOOCs that are fee-based. And it's open also in the sense that it doesn't have any prerequisites, or if there are prerequisites, they are very limited. Like I mentioned in that uh, example, a 10-year-old could join a MOOC and a 70-year-old could, could um, uh, take, take that MOOC. It's online, uh, so it's internet-based, and with the internet delivery comes unlimited possibilities as far as access and reaching an international audience. And MOOCs are available through specialized platforms that are capable of handling that amount of data, big amounts of data. MOOCs are not entirely courses, but they do have some um, conventions of a traditional course. Mainly that it has a predefined start and end time, um, although some MOOCs now are self-paced. Um, they adhere to a weekly uh, uh, <coughs> uh, organization of topics, uh, around topics. Uh, they don't need to be weekly, but usually uh, every week there's a new topic that's covered within, within the larger scope of a MOOC. And usually they are facilitated by an acknowledged expert in the field. And that's part of the appeal of, of a MOOC, to have somebody that is a, a well-known figure in that um, particular subject. In 2013, the University of Puerto Rico, um, we decided to explore um, massive open online courses. They were just emerging as a, as a big uh, phenomenon in online education. George Siemens, well, who was the, one of the, the first um, facilitators of, of, of the MOOC said that no, um, there hasn't been a time in history where higher education as a system has responded as rapidly to a trend as with open online courses. Um, so we wanted to see what the hype was all about and um, this MOOC was exploratory in nature. It was not part of a strategic initi initiative on the part of the university, but we wanted to address two main aspects. Will a MOOC help the university reach uh, an international audience? Is it true? Will it happen? And is it possible with the design of a MOOC that's prepackaged without uh, knowing who's going to take it? Is it possible to design a MOOC that can satisfy the learning expectations of, of, the, of every student? That's what we set out to um, explore with this MOOC. So it was part pedagogical innovation, part research. We offered it in the platform uh, Mirieda X, which is the Ibero-American platform uh, for MOOCs. And um, we chose that platform because we had, uh, the University of Puerto Rico had a contractual relationship or a partnership with Universia, who's um, a network of universities in, in Latin America. And uh, Mirieda X was part, uh, a joint partner with Universia. Now, this MOOC uh, was created as a two-person team. The facilitator of the MOOC, Dr. Juan Melendez, who you may have seen today uh, in the, uh, as the moderator of the winner's panel, or uh, yesterday in the um, opening session. And um, myself, I was the producer of the course with a background in instructional design and e-learning. The faces. Okay, we start with design. Design is very important for this MOOC because we wanted to design it in such a way that we could try to accommodate the varying pre learning preferences and needs of the students, not knowing who would take the course, right? So um, we designed a repeatable methodology and the course was on instructional design itself. So it was sort of a meta MOOC we applied instructional design principles that we were covering in the course to the actual design of this MOOC. Um, it had four, uh, we, it was, they had four topics. Each week had its own topic, uh, backward design, universal design, impact evaluation or authentic evaluation, and interactivity. Those were the four components. We also added an introductory week, which it wasn't really a full week. It was an introductory period where people could socialize and um, 
start to connect, make connections with each other before we actually started the MOOC. So you see that there's the repeatable structure for weeks one through four, um, but the first week had a slightly different structure. Each week we had uh, repeatable components. We had a survey, which was our main way of um, getting data for our research study. Five videos that uh, introduced the topic, three, well, one video introduced the topic, three videos covered the, the topic, and one, the last video summarized the topic. That was the structure within the five um, the videos of each week. Two readings, one was required and one was uh, supplementary, or complementary. And uh, we had a quiz. Each quiz had three questions, a 66% passing rate, and three attempts. The quiz, we didn't really want to use quiz because, quizzes because we, uh, our assessment strategy at module three, which is impact or authentic evaluation, tells us more that students, uh, the assessment of learning doesn't really come from recall. Uh, and with the quizzes tend to uh, just prove that the participant is able to recall the information. We wanted to create authentic evaluations. Um, but the platform provider uh, required two ways of assessment. So we included one quiz and then our preferred method of assessment, which was the assignment. Each assignment um, was a peer graded assignment. So the, the student would create um, their own product and submit it for the evaluation of, of the three peers. Um, and each student in turn had to review the work of three other peers and the collective sum of those was uh, constituted the grade for the student. We also had forums. Each week had two forums. One of the forums was dedicated to the research. We wanted to, the survey would get quantitative data from students and the forum would get qualitative data from students. The other forum was related to the topic that being covered in each week. We repeated this methodology week after week so the student knew exactly um, what to expect um, at the beginning of, of each week. Once a week or a topic opened, it remained open for the du entire duration of the course. So the student, even though had deadlines to complete every week, the deadlines were flexible. They really had until the end of the, of the course to submit all of their work. 